Good afternoon and welcome to the second episode of our Cisco Executive Live series, Navigating the Shift. My name is RJ Ledesma, very honored to be your host for today's webinar. Today, we will talk about an industry that's been under the spotlight for the past several months, the local healthcare industry. With this current pandemic, hospitals have had to pivot quickly and look for safer ways to support the needs of their patients and, of course, of the healthcare professionals. Now, to give us a much clearer picture of the challenges that the healthcare industry faces, and also the best practices they've learned over the past several months. We brought together a panel of industry experts and healthcare innovators joining us for this episode. First, from one of our biggest hospitals here in Metro Manila, please welcome Makati Medical Center's Chief Information Officer, Kit Sumabat. Joining Kit right now and joining us all the way from Cebu, please welcome Chonghua Hospital's Vice President for IT, James Indino Jr. We also have with us a representative from the Department of Health. I'm sure he's very well known to the rest of you, the Director of Knowledge Management and IT Services, Dr. Enrique Tayag. And rounding out our guests here for this episode, representing the HMO industry, please welcome the co-founder and CEO of AllCare, who just won the SME Company of the Year at the Asia CEO Awards 2020, my good friend, Cindy Burdett. And finally, to provide us with a more ASEAN perspective, we have joining us as well, Keenan Yoruko, Cisco's industry advisor for healthcare in the ASEAN region. Again, to all of our gentlemen and ladies joining us on this panel, thank you so much for giving us a better perspective of what is happening in the healthcare industry. Now, I'd like to get the ball rolling and speak, first of all, to my good friend, Kit uh, from Makati Medical Center. And of course, after that one, I'd like to also ask James uh, the same question. Now, for many of us, especially those of us just observing the situation, most of us are under the impression that right now, hospitals must be a pandemic-proof business because many people are flocking to the hospital, particularly uh, if they are suspect of COVID. But it seems that it's actually counterintuitive. Many hospitals have been greatly in impacted because non-COVID patients who would avail of the services normally the hospital are avoiding going to the hospital right now. Kit, can you give us a more on the ground uh, example? What is actually happening to the hospitals right now? Uh, thank you, RJ, and that's true. No? Uh, most of the patients, uh, especially those who uh, who do not have COVID-19 or are not suspected of COVID-19 are um, avoiding the hospitals. So uh, right now there's a there's a very big shift in terms of our uh, the volume of patients coming into the hospital, which also affects the revenue of the hospital and their sustainability. Uh, hence, we were trying our best to adapt uh, to those changes. Uh, with you know uh, implementation of technology, changing our uh, procedures, and you know just uh, in general, just changing our mindset and our strategies. If you talk about in just in general, what is happening in general? What do you guys have to do in terms of the shift from both a perspective of of, of care management and also in terms of hospital management? So a lot of the uh, a lot of the services that we used to deliver uh, in the hospital exclusively are now being delivered uh, at the at the homes or in the offices of our clients no so we started uh, providing services such as home care uh, services telemedicine services uh, to our clients right so in the past i mean we've we've had that for for quite some time already but the utilization are very low so right now that's uh, the appointments for those types of services are just uh, off the roof I see, I see. So it's sort of like your old, this This is already a distribution channel for the hospital, these sort of home or office services where they bring the hospital experience to your homes. But right now, because of this crisis, it uh, accelerated uh, the use of this distribution channel. Am I right? Yeah, that's correct, RJ. Uh, uh, so we've, in, in many ways, uh, COVID-19 has it's been a catalyst for uh, the digital disruption in the healthcare industry, so to speak. 
Okay. And then as it accelerated that one, what were the technological services that, that have to that had to improve as well or had to uh, accelerate in the hospital to be able to achieve this type of service? Well, in the past, we've had uh, we're one of the few organizations in the country that has electronic medical record and mm -hmm. hospital information system, but that's very limited uh, to uh, uh, to the use within the hospital. So right now we have to go. Uh, above and beyond that, uh, we, need, we need to extend our services outside. Hence, a lot of our technologies, a lot of the technologies that we've implemented in the past few months uh, need to adapt towards more uh, mobility of our healthcare providers. I see. I guess even the security of information, especially now because you're involving more outside parties to what the hospital is doing, I guess that's also very key for you guys. Yeah, that's very true. Um, in, in the past few a uh, few months, we've experienced a surge of, um, uh, shall I say, information security uh, attempts uh, to the hospital. And this is shared not just uh, in Makati Medical Center, but in many other hospitals uh, in, in the country and elsewhere in the world. Uh, so we also have to beef up our uh, cybersecurity defenses along with that. Thanks again, Kit, for sharing with us the on-the-ground situation there in Metro Manila. Now, moving to the Visayas, uh, James, are you getting the same thing as well? Are the hospital businesses being adversely impacted by the number of uh, non-COVID patients who are now trying to avoid the hospital? Uh, what's happening in your case? Yeah, that's very true. Uh, people avoid the hospital because of fun, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, fear because they fear of getting sick, uh, meaning hospital-acquired diseases, and uncertainty because they do not know when their next income will come. So they'd rather defer uh, hospital uh, medical services uh, until it's a bit clearer, both on the health side as well as income. I see. So, what is the, what are you guys? What is the hospital trying to do here right now to sort of uh, manage across the situation? Are they also doing that same sort of uh, remote services or telemedicine? Uh, what are the general things that uh, Chong Wai is doing right now to sort of uh, manage the situation? Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. Um, there's a joke in LinkedIn uh, that digitization uh, has um, spread uh, quickly. Not because of the CIO or the CEO, but because of COVID. That's very That's true. true. Uh, applying that in the current situation, we've now uh, tried to go uh, digital as fast as we can. Uh, registration uh, online before you see your doctor is now a must. Okay. Um, booking appointments is also done online before you go to the hospital. So there's a pre screening upfront. So we're, we're really into that, uh, even the payment uh, mechanism right now. We really try to advocate a cashless payment, but there's still a certain group within the community that still has those kinds of uh, um, mechanism payment. They're not really equipped to do uh, cashless transactions. Okay. So we're trying to look for a way on how to deal with that. I see, I see. And are you also experiencing the same issue of, let's say, for example, uh, uh, with regard to cybersecurity? I'm sure because right now you're doing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, interaction right now out, outside. And uh, are you experiencing the same thing that Makati Med is that you know there, there's uh, there's a need to beef up cybersecurity as well? Yeah, that's a worry that we have to uh, deal with right now. So my cybersecurity guys are up. Uh, and they've been monitoring. Uh, we do have defenses, but I mean, these ransomware guys are always on the lookout on how to penetrate defenses. Um, luckily, uh, we have not had any incidences uh, right now. I see. Well, thanks so much for enlightening us on the situation there in Cebu as well. So, Keenan, we've heard from both Kit and James the situation. It, it appeared to be that the, the COVID cases were keeping people from going uh, to the hospitals and that impacted their non-COVID operations or their patients who needed their services but didn't go to the hospital because of COVID. What has been happening in the rest of the region? Uh, have, have they been experiencing the same sort of phenomenon? Thanks, Sajay. Uh, yes, to be, and, and the rest of the region was seeing a very similar uh, pattern to what James and Kip mentioned. 
um, both with the patients and with the clinicians as well, because we're seeing a lot of clinicians not wanting to go into the hospitals mm -hmm. because of the pandemic and wanting to do the consultations from home, which again has been driving the hospitals to develop and deploy telemedicine and teleconsultation services. Okay, and um, what else have the, how else have the other patients been managing in the other countries? Uh, basically, they just they just all shifted to telemedicine, uh, both the very developed parts of the region and the developing parts of the region. Yes, we're seeing an increased adoption of telehealth and telemedicine services across the region. Um, ASEAN has got a very high mobile network adoption rate, so mm -hmm. we've got a very mobile population with a lot of mobile devices. And we're seeing the patients taking advantage of that and the hospital providers taking advantage of that as well by providing these telemedicine services um, through mobile devices and through the platforms, the mobile application platforms in these countries. Thanks so much, Keenan. Now, moving on to the public sector and doc, again, our public servant over here, Dr. Tayag, what's been the situation as well for public hospitals? Because many public hospitals have been the place where many of the uh, when many of the COVID patients have been uh, directed to actually go for their services. Is that also impacting? Uh, I'm sure it is, but then how big is the impact to your uh, non-COVID patients who aren't showing up in public hospitals right now? Okay, here's the situation, RJ. Government hospitals are should accept 30% for their bed capacity uh, delegated to COVID-19 patients. And so for non-COVID patients, that's only 70%. For the private hospitals, that's 20% for COVID-19 patients. And our public hospitals had to demonstrate agility because there are hospitals that have to limit their services and there are hospitals that have to suddenly build their capacity. They can be able to accommodate COVID-19 patients and non-COVID-19 patients. But here's the rub, RJ. When these hospitals, our public hospitals, had to decide whether they're going to limit or expand their services, it has to make a decision because this will require, for example, changes in the way they manage their hospital systems, their information systems, their human resources, and of course, their logistics. And the Department of Health has to make sure that we are coordinating the processes within hospitals and outside hospitals so that uh, patient engagement and experience uh, become relevant to the patients. That's what's happening, RJ. It's a difficult time for hospitals. They are coping, but uh, right, right now, the Department of Health is looking at avenues for making sure we establish the foundations for the new normal. I see. Um, for, in, in your case, uh, Dr. Tayag, for the public hospitals, you were saying that, of course, they're having to change their uh, they, they have to change all of the back end to make sure that they can accommodate these patients. How quickly uh, were they able to just adjust these hospitals? And what are some of the challenges that they're experiencing to adjust to accommodate all of these uh, COVID patients? And of, of course, the non-COVID patients at the same time. Okay, it's a mixed thing. For those hospitals that have uh, anticipated this situation and with very good business continuity plan, they were able to adapt immediately. And for those hospitals that we have to support and provide technical assistance so they can adopt technology and uh, other innovations for healthcare, then we just have to do handholding. And for hospitals that falter, then we they have to look at their systems and seriously look at their future because uh -huh. uh, there is no guarantee because of this uh, uncertainty. And so what we did was to make sure that technology is available for them. So we had to prioritize RJ and one of those we prioritize is telemedicine. And telemedicine. this is this actually all it is for the DOH patients who hesitate to go outside, visit their doctors, visit hospitals, have now the option at the comfort of their homes to use telemedicine and consult health providers. But of course, there are benefits and there are potential threats for these kinds of technology. And we have to 
learn from experience when uh, we make sure that this technology is actually uh, adapted to our advantage. That's right. Uh, like James was saying earlier on in his answer, uh, all of a sudden, uh, what's caused the acceleration of our digital transformation is COVID-19, and sometimes we just have to do it and learn from learn from there, I guess, and that's what's happening right now with uh, telemedicine. Yes, and RJ, that's with our problem with uh, connectivity, uh, IT infrastructure, uh, and uh, and now in in education, uh, everybody has this blended uh, adoption of technologies, and so therefore, in the Department of Health, we have to be agile. That's right. I'm actually very curious to find out right now how Keenan is also seeing this from a from a from a global or more ASEAN perspective and sees inputs in just a bit. But before we move on to Keenan, I want to talk to my good friend Cindy over here. Uh, Cindy actually uh, did, has a startup, a uh, health management organization or HMO startup. Uh, Cindy, tell us just a bit more about what your HMO is all about, how it works, and then maybe from there you can tell us as to how is your your startup HMO. Uh, what is it? What is its experience right now with regard to COVID? Are more people all of a sudden signing up as a result uh, of this crisis? Please let us know. Okay, uh, so we work with a lot of HMO providers, right? So the way all care works is that we've created sort of a technology layer and also a data layer where normal people and small businesses can avail of certain products that traditionally are more difficult to avail from directly from the big guys like MaxiCare, IntelliCare, PhilCare, Nation Life. No? And with the pandemic, the, the impact into the consciousness of health awareness is palpable. You cannot mistake it. However, there is really uh, there's a need for the HMO industry as a whole to really uh, revisit the way we look at risk, for example, and the way that health uh, benefits and health services are distributed. And so at All Care, for example, because we aggregate services, right, including mm -hmm. health and non-health or more wellness-inclined approach, it was very easy for us to really deliver certain services that were normally not easily available. For example, okay. RT-PCR swab test, big uh, question mark in the HMO industry. Are we going to cover that, right? But for us in all care, it's not actually a matter of are we going to cover it? But for us, it's more of, okay, can we find a group that can make this happen at the most affordable rate at the fastest way possible using technology, right? And we've been able to work with RT-PCR, rapid antigen testing, and so many more services because we have that network of services already. And in fact, and I relate very well to the uh, on the on the automation of the registration and automation mm -hmm. of the telehealth, for example, because for us there's really no physical interaction, right? You can really avail of any and all of our services through our technology layer. So when somebody says, you know, my uncle tested uh, positive, we need to keep getting tests. It's a matter of logging into All Care and then booking that directly. So it's a, uh, it you can really probably see the impact, the increased awareness and consciousness about health. But there is a need to answer that also in a very, I guess, transformative way, no? and really be be agile in the way as what Dr. Eric Tayag said. Do you also see a number of people, more people subscribing to the services of All Care as a result of this of this uh, pandemic? So actually, this is the interesting interesting story that we've encountered. So right mm -hmm. when the pandemic hit, and this is funny because on the day that the lockdown was implemented, I had to fly mm -hmm. back to Manila. Otherwise, I would be stuck in Cebu because we were building our Cebu office. And I, remember, okay. I stayed right near Chonghua in, in Big Hotel. <laughs> okay. and, uh, and, and March, April, May, we saw our numbers spike. And I think that was because of that increased consciousness, right? But mm -hmm. in the same way as what James mentioned, the doubt started to creep in. People started doubting until when is this pandemic going to happen? The uncertainty of their incomes also started to really sink in. And then we started to see a decline. People would inquire, okay. people would ask, and then defer the purchase until they were sure that they had the income to do so. I see, I see. So it wasn't that they didn't want your service, they were just, want, they were just worried about more of do I have the income to, to pay for the services which I will acquire? 
And Cindy, just a related question uh, to this one over here. Um, because you've had to grow, you're an ag basically an aggregator. M my, my guess is that you're using cloud solution to be able to do your aggregation or to, to do your services. Uh, can you tell us a bit more as to how you had to pivot or how, how things changed for you or how you had to accelerate your services and use, and, and use cloud as a strategy to grow your business during this time? Uh, great question. So uh, all of our data obviously start in the cloud. So anytime somebody would need, uh, we would need to connect with another provider, for example. Um, it's very easy for us to engage in that data sharing uh, connection because of APIs that are available uh, online, right? That's one. And uh, secondly, when we need to recover certain information or the client will request for any of their medical records uh, or mm -hmm. any of their uh, membership records, for example, mm -hmm. that is as easy as clicking a button, literally. But at the same time, I need to admit, because the pandemic has really forced everybody into an arena of adaptation, right? Yes. There are times that we've had to forego the technical integration at the beginning to a more manual approach so that we can already deliver the services and then slowly in an agile way, work our way through that integration. And I guess that's where really cloud facilitates that, right? You can do the work manually already and then slowly integrate into the cloud, um, especially if both providers and us, for example, as an aggregator, have that technology available. Well, thanks so much, Cindy, for enlightening us on, on the HMO perspective, and especially a very agile and young uh, HMO as yourself. Now, um, earlier on, we, we dealt with this question that, yes, consumer behavior has actually changed right now, especially uh, consumer behavior with regard to healthcare. And as we know, no, habits are formed, let's say, in 30 days. And we've been in this lockdown for about seven months right now. Uh, so there's habits has been, that have been formed for the, pe the patients, the potential patients, and there are also habits that have been formed by the professionals. So what have you been seeing as the predominant behaviors right now that have, that have evolved for patients and, and also that have evolved for health professionals? And how are, how, are you, how are the hospitals adjusting to all these changes? I know we've discussed it earlier on, but let's go take a deeper dive and see what's actually happening. Uh, Kit, what are you seeing as the new behaviors of the customers nowadays and also the challenges faced by both the patients and the professionals to get the services? Yes, RJ, we, we've seen a surge of the digital demand, right? Uh, so whether it's uh, within the hospital and outside of the hospital. So for example, um, we've, we've had to double our bandwidth capacity okay. uh, for the hospital. Uh, right now, I would say that we're, we're probably one of the uh, few hospitals who, who has uh, Who's using telco grade, enterprise grade, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity uh, to provide services to our healthcare providers? Because in the past, uh, even if you know for whatever reason that they're they're not using their their devices, um, and then they connect to the Wi-Fi, uh, connect to the internet, they're more forgiving right now because of the demand. It's not just something that they that it's not just a want; it becomes a need. Yes, right. They, they need to connect to uh, to the internet because they they need to do uh, to do uh, video conferencing calls. They need to do telemedicine and so on. But aside from that, we've also introduced other uh, platforms and services within our infrastructure. We've introduced Internet of Things so that uh, our employees uh, don't need to go around um, uh, to check on patients. So we we've you know, uh, implemented remote monitoring systems, remote sensors that monitors the, the temperature and the environment within the hospital. We've uh, integrated um, a lot of our services to be more digital. Uh, we've you know, significantly increased our, uh, or decreased rather, our paper trail uh, mm -hmm. within the hospital, right? So a lot of those has changed uh, the behavior um, of our customers. In the past, you wouldn't expect them to fill out an online uh, health screening form before they come into the building, right? So, That's right. Uh, and, and we've seen that, uh, especially for the doctors, uh, we're quite surprised that a lot of the uh, more senior doctors, uh, so to speak, um, have adapted very well with the technology. 
right? But you, you need to make sure that the usability of those technology um, is well within their bandwidth, okay? So it needs to be simple, it needs to be seamless uh, into their workflow. So we've seen a lot of uh, behavior changes that in the past, these you know senior doctors wouldn't even bother asking me asking me about IT. <laughs> and right now, whenever I bump into them in the hallway, they would ask me, Kit, can we do this? Kit, how can I improve my my patient services this way? Right? So they all of a the sudden they've become um, all techy, right? And I even for the <laughs> like they've all become IT savvy and to, to oh. a certain extent some of them has become a quote unquote experts. Uh, they're wow. they're giving me advice on how to do it, <laughs> right? So, uh, so, so, so the fact, the silver lining for the hospital that the doctors are becoming a bit more tech savvy. Yeah, it's it's good. It's just a matter of so the the interesting part there is uh, now the capacity of the IT uh, departments of the IT divisions of the hospitals are trying to keep up with those services. You know? so uh, we're we're seeing a significant shift now from uh, a lot of the things that we used to do manually. Uh, to automating those things uh, instead of building data centers within our uh, premises, uh, we, mm -hmm. we've significantly shifted a, a lot of our in infrastructure in the cloud. Now, for the patients, mm -hmm. uh, in the past, they uh, it's not intuitive for them to book an, a teleconsultation appointment, right? To do um, uh, to do. Uh, um, online appointment before they yes. come to the hospital, right? So right now, uh, that's part of their workflow. Before they come to the hospital, we know their demographic information already. We, we capture a lot of information before they come in. And then they come in, uh, even their payment, uh, what's done uh, post uh, prepaid already. Before they come into the hospital, they paid for the services. They yes. spend you know, just a few minutes in the hospital, get their procedure done. And then off they go again. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, you know, I just want to say that you know I've I've actually gone to Makati Med two or three times and I've, I've gone through the procedure. It's pretty smooth because I get to fill up my QR code here in the house, and uh, right. and I go and submit the, the form over there. But as you do more telemedicine, does it require also more teleconferencing? You have to improve also the the video conferencing facilities, not just the not just the security, but also the bandwidth for the doctors to do a lot more of this. Uh, teleconferencing facilities. Tell me a bit more about the video conferencing that you guys are doing. What are you doing to improve that one? Yeah, well, uh, the, when, when we were choosing the telemedicine platform, we had to consider not just the usability, but also the security of the telemedicine platform that we will use, right? And uh, so there's you, you, ha you now have to balance both the security from the IT perspective, cybersecurity perspective, and the usability coming from the doctors, no? so they would, uh, even if it's the most secure system, if they cannot use it, uh, uh, it, it doesn't serve its purpose, right? And for the bandwidth, uh, we, we've, as, as I mentioned earlier, we've practically doubled the bandwidth uh, capacity of the hospital already. And I'm anticipating if this pandemic goes on, uh, and you know we're well, we don't see the end yet. We're not seeing the end yet. Uh, we might as well double again uh, by next year our bandwidth capacity and even our you know the, our network infrastructure uh, within the hospital has been significantly upgraded. In the past, uh, it's it's good enough for uh, for the patients to have internet um, in the more conspicuous. Uh, areas in the hospital mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right now, uh, mm -hmm. they will file a complaint if they don't have internet in their bathroom, right? <laughs> so we, we, we have to upgrade and enhance a lot of our infrastructure to support all, a lot of those. Thanks so much, Kit. Uh, James, I'm sure that I'm sure as you were listening, a lot of the experiences that Kit was was having with Makati Major also uh, it's something you also can commiserate and relate to over there in Chongwa. Tell us a bit more about how the behaviors change, especially how they've adapted, I guess, to, to using uh, going online or using te technology, both for the patients and also for the health professionals in Chongwa. Uh, we've also, yeah, my, my president is very, um, she's very patient centric. So one day she went around uh, the COVID areas and saw some uh, patients who were uh, trying to get a signal uh, from uh, the mobile data. And, 
And um, after that, she immediately told me, populate those areas wherein we do not have a signal. I don't care uh, how many, just put in uh, access points on all those areas so that, especially with COVID patients, they can have um, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. Because she told me that, imagine you being stuck in the hospital room for two weeks with no connection. How do you now get to say hi to your loved ones and uh, communicate that you're still fine? So, uh, James, thanks so much for addressing how it's like, especially how the, how the hospital is becoming patient-centric with regards to uh, digital transformation. How about for the doctors? What are you also doing for them? And, and the hospital management services in general, what has had to change with regard to technology and how are you addressing the changes that need to be done? Well, um, I'll give an example. Some of our radiologists were stuck in uh, certain areas outside of Cebu. So mm -hmm. we've had to facilitate them accessing our uh, PAC system. We've had to do that via providing them a VPN so that they could still read um, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, X-ray material. So um, that's one example. Another example is uh, for our rehab. Now our rehab facility needs to be equipped with um, telemedicine function that's not yet up because they have very specific requirements which we are trying to facilitate. As soon as they give a go signal on that, we will need to be able to provide for them. So there's okay. a lot of things that are uh, going on and uh, some things I cannot uh, discuss right now. I understand. Because I understand. It's still in the works. Oh, but but I mean, as, as I listen to you, I think it's also, I mean, I know I've stressed this before in the past, but again, cybersecurity becomes a very key thing, especially now that you're having to send information inside of the hospital. Uh, is that right? Exactly, exactly. Which is why we're always in touch with our uh, partner vendors on how to better secure our uh, infrastructure. So we're, we're up on our toes um, uh, in terms of cybersecurity, especially when you hear about uh, hospitals in London getting attacked by ransomware. That's right. That's right. Thanks so much, James, for uh, updating us. No, oh, Doctor Taya, what's the situation right now in our, in our public hospitals as well? Because you're really catering to a broad swath, broad spectrum of our spectrum of our society. Uh, how the, how have the habits changed for our customers, uh, for our for our patients, and and what are they doing to address all these changes? And what are also the, the doctors in our private hospitals and the the hospital management doing? Uh, what, are, what are the changes that are occurring and how are they coping with them? So if you have the gadgets, then you have this confidence, this trust to use the technology like telemedicine. Okay, you don't have to worry about your connectivity. You have your uh, affordability to make sure you pay for your connection. But how about those people who don't have these gadgets? And that's what we worry in the Department of Health because the inequality or inequity, we just cannot tolerate that. Mm -hmm. Everyone should have that chance to use technology. That's why we are worried that uh, when third party developers come to us and offer the technology, we ask this question first, is this going to benefit the poor? Mm -hmm. Because the poor, are the ones who actually use technology when they have it. Because this is one way of addressing the gap between those who don't have enough information and those who get information at the right time. Because health-seeking behavior is influenced by the information they get. But this is funny, RJ. Those mm -hmm. gadgets, okay, are prone to infodemics, for fake news. And so therefore, <laughs> those who don't have these gadgets are shielded from the fake news. What an irony, okay? And so there's a mix. Those who have gadgets, yes, they can uh, easily go into telemedicine and then they want to satisfy their themselves and they get into the fake news. On the other hand, the poor don't have these gadgets and uh, what government offers, they're going to use it, and they're shielded somehow from the fake news. Okay, okay. 
So they so they short they, all the uh, all the uh, fake news with regard to remedies or solutions. Hindi nila alam. They just know what is the uh, the, the 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 less fortunate, the disenfranchised. Those they only know okay. what, what comes out officially. In other words. Yes, and now we're looking at uh, what ha how this has impacted technology, the yes. health providers. It's a generation thing. I'll, t I'll tell you this. The older professionals had suddenly had to learn when they're used to having their secretary take the dictation. <laughs> <laughs> now they are scampering and teaching their fingers to make sure that they don't uh, make these mistakes when okay. they use the gadgets, <laughs> the technology. And the younger ones, okay, well, they don't read emails. They read the other social media. They use the social media platforms. So one day, for example, when I asked my staff, like, uh, where's, I, I was waiting for the draft. It's not in my email. Oh, it's in your Viber. Uh, <laughs> okay. so, uh, 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 it has changed. The digital divide in generation, in, uh, in the generation of people using this technology has somehow disrupted the way we get information and get services. And okay. uh, there's one thing more, the last one, mm -hmm. RJ, which is important, the culture. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We ask ourselves, are we in the Philippines, okay, have the right culture to adopt technology? Because uh, other people are remain traditional. They want the old ways. They want to see the, page, the health provider face to face. It's not someone in the monitor that That's I right. just imagine that's there. And uh, I want to make sure that I'm actually physically examined and not just ans answering a list of questions and then making a decision that this is my diagnosis and this is my treatment. So there has, yeah, we have to manage the change and that's slowly right, we're right. going there, RJ. That's right. Actually, I'm pretty cur curious later on. I'm going to make ask Kina to take a mental note of this one. I mean, this is one of the issues that I that, that technology also has to address. I guess really that because of social distancing or telemedicine, there's still that that, that human need to meet people. And I want to just figure out what have been the best practices around the region and I guess around the world to sort of address this concern among many of the patients and also the doctors that there still needs to be some sort of face-to-face -face interaction. I'd like to see how technology is sort of uh, mitigating the solution around the world. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Taya, for answering that one. Now, um, I, I'm going to go back one more time to our friends from the hospitals and, and from, to the HMOs before I, I move on to Keenan. But, you know, the, the, the key word during this crisis really has been all about the word pivot, 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 and innovate in your services uh, to make sure that, that, uh, uh, that we're still able to deliver our services. Uh, like, for example, I belong to the food and beverage industry. We're saying right now, if you cannot, if they cannot come to the restaurant, you bring the restaurant service to their home, right? So it's sort of like you're, you're, you're changing the way that you deliver the service. Uh, more or less, what have you, I know you've shared with us some of the pivots that the hospitals have been doing and the HMOs have been doing. Um, but in the case of healthcare, what do you think are the significant innovations and pivots that you guys have had to do, particularly in the last seven months? Uh, let's, let's start with you. What have you guys had to pivot and what have you seen uh, in terms of a pivot of the hospital services that have been pretty successful in your perspective? Well, what's interesting with, uh, with Makati Medical Center is that a lot of these uh, digital services has been around for quite a while already. No? So we've had uh, successful uh, pilot implementations. Some of them are already uh, running and we, we, we have some patronage with a select customer groups. So what okay. we've seen is that uh, in the past, when you uh, uh, look at our customer segments uh, and you identify their different personas, a lot of them are not really digital ready, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden, uh, uh, in the past few months, they've become uh, forced to be digital ready, no? So in the past, they're just digital aware. They know it's the services are there, uh, they know they can do appointments uh, through the website, uh, but they would still rather pick up the phone and do the appointments themselves. But because you know the surge of the of the patients uh, setting an appointment uh, has just uh, increased so much, uh, our our uh, in-house call center facility cannot accommodate them. Then they they use other channels. 
uh, what we've seen is that we've we had to pivot in terms of, and I agree with Dr. Tayag, in terms of our culture. So not a lot of the healthcare providers are ready or were ready before, and then they were forced to adapt to this, uh, to adapt to these technologies. Uh, uh, so we've seen a lot of them who are very resistant to change, uh, resistant to, uh, to a digital uh, transformation uh, that has suddenly not just become uh, users, but became champions of these technologies. No? Uh, uh, aside from that, we've, we had to make some small pivots. That, so what my, my perspective is, we can pivot the entire hospital industry. As what Dr. Taig was saying, uh, you need to identify different customer segments. So not everyone will be digital ready. Uh, some of them will still prefer to come to the hospital to see their doctors, and that's fine. Uh, and then pivoting uh, in this day and age doesn't only mean pivoting in, the, in terms of technology. You can also pivot your processes, um, your, your the culture of the people, and so on. So in terms of the process, uh, instead of uh, the patients coming into the hospital to see their doctors, we've now seen a lot of um, patients booking an appointment for their doctors to come to their respective houses, right? So, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm sure in the days of my uh, parents and grandparents, uh, also not to before, no, yung mga home, house, home house visits call. of, yeah. uh, house calls, home visits of the doctors. And then all of a sudden, ngayon, uh, people are demanding for it, right? So we were putting together more comprehensive solutions to address that, uh, those needs. Mm, I see. I see. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thanks so much for sharing that uh, with us, uh, Kit. Uh, James, in your part, uh, in, in Chongwa, uh, in general, just what are the type of innovations and pivots that you guys have had to do to adjust and that you've seen has achieved, uh, uh, you know, pretty much a, a, good, a, good, uh, a good track record so far over these past seven months? Yeah, um, as we said earlier, we've had uh, to do online registration um, starting during the start of the pandemic, we've had some uh, appointment appointment booking for consults, diagnostics uh, scheduling. We've also provided online test results. We also have drive throughs for both hospitals, Cebu and Mandawe. But what were the were, were there also those are pivots? So those are little changes that you had to make. But were there also any innovations, things that you had to you know introduce new new things that you want to introduce that all of a sudden you know wow this did this did pretty well we didn't realize it but when you made that innovation things uh, really took a turn for the better yeah um, those that I mentioned are really appreciated by our clients and uh, we see from uh, early adoption to a real need right now. So as I said earlier, you can't come into the hospital, do a mm -hmm. consultation with the do your doctor without going through an appointment scheduling system. Okay, I see. Thanks so much for sharing with us, James. Uh, Dr. Tayag, very interesting. So public hospitals, I mean, you know, you would think that sometimes uh, the public hospitals might might be behind with regard to innovation, but actually sometimes they're, they're, they're at the forefront because they're seeing a, a large spectrum of, of society. So what are the changes and in, in innovations that are in the in the public sector hospitals that uh, that is helping uh, cope with the situation? Thank you, RJ, for those uh, observations. Uh, did you know, for example, that uh, uh, we there was an increasing uh, demand for uh, volunteer health providers in the telemedicine uh, services and uh, we were so happy to get uh, many volunteers from organizations so that we are able to deliver telemedicine on a 24 7 basis and that's a success and we did not expect that during this uh, pandemic response but uh, there is another silver lining for the pandemic and uh, what is that for example, when our patients are actually into a telemedicine consultation, the health providers are able to make quick decisions and they are referred if 
hospitalization is required, the patients do not have to worry where to look for these hospitals. Early in the pandemic, there were hospital closures, uh, they turn away patients, but now at least in Metro Manila, we were able to make sure that every patient who needs confinement will not miss their bed 24 seven. And that's a target that we hope to achieve every day so that it removes patient worries. Now, for the technology to really happen, we have to look for trustworthy brands. Uh, number two, we have to make sure that they are affordable, mm -hmm. uh, if not free. Uh, number three, and count on their social responsibility. Number three, that we can have the capacity to actually use the technology and uh, make sure that it will benefit the poor. RJ, I have to emphasize that any technology for the DOH that does not benefit the poor is off limits. We actually challenge those who offer technology, make sure the poor will not be disenfranchised. It should be inclusive. That's our policy. And uh, one more thing about technology is that we can learn from the best practices. I'm sure Chonghua Hospital and Makati Medical Center will not be selfish in sharing their best practices so that we can learn from them. And they can also learn from us because we have to work together. There should be no private hospitals, private sector of public hospital. There should only be one hospital for the Philippines. Thank you, RJ. Thanks so much. Very important, our collaborative efforts. And the spirit of Bayanina has really come out uh, during this time. Thanks so much for sharing with us, uh, Dr. Tayag, about that. And, and Cindy, I mean, Cindy, her startup is already very innovative as it is, no? and her startup is all about uh, aggregating the different healthcare plans from different healthcare providers and pro providing them piecemeal, sort of like what you want, Dr. Taig, an inclusive type of healthcare system. That's what Cindy is trying to promote right now. But uh, Cindy, right now, during this crisis, did you have to further pivot as well and innovate on what's already an innovation uh, in the industry? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, to summarize, we pivoted or innovated further in three areas. Now, for example, for products, we work closely with our bigger brothers and sisters in the HMO industry to really come up with uh, prepaid products. And as you mentioned, no, put together a curated plan that's affordable, but at the same time, very, very relevant just for this mm -hmm. season. So for example, if you go on, on all care, you'll see that uh, we have prepaid plans specifically for emergency needs, right? Where it will cover both your telehealth, your emergency needs, but also will give you consults in a piecemeal kind of way. So we really created uh, sort of products that are uh, in the times, no? And secondly, we also innovated in the process. So for example, before notoriously HMO networks will require that you work with a network accredited doctor for it to be valid, right? And some you already have a request, but because it's not from the doctor, uh, they won't accept it. But again, right. we're in tele telemedicine world, right? And so now we've found a way to work with these uh, networks and say, hey, it's from a telemedicine provider. They, the, the doctor is telling them they need this. We need the process to conform to this need. No? And again, it's really a Bionian spirit season all over. So they've accepted that new process. And because we also have the data to show that this is the trend, right? And then lastly, with people, we've become so customer centric now that, you know, we understand that when, like, for example, yesterday, celebrating uh, an event, and then somebody texted me that their uh, grandfather passed away in their uh -huh. home. And the funeral oh. home will not accommodate them until they get an RT-PCR. And I found it uh, super, super uh, weird wow. and awkward, but I also understand, right? And so because that family is uh, services, right, we were able to quickly find a provider to help them, even if it wasn't part of the standard process now. So we really have conformed to become more customer-centric and make sure we understand what they're going through in this time. And again, it's very important, again, that, that you have the data uh, to be able to do that very quickly. 
and the analytics to provide that very quickly for you. Correct. Correct. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much for that one, Cindy. And now, Keenan, I, I'm looking forward to asking you questions. I'm sure you've had time to, to take in all the different feedback that you got of, of the pain points that the hospitals, the patients, and also the healthcare providers have had to uh, contend with and also the changes that they've had to make. And you've also had a good perspective of seeing what's not only happening here in the Philippines, but also uh, in other geographies and other countries as well, uh, to how they've, how they've innovated during this crisis. What have you seen are the noteworthy practices that are being done in the other countries, best practices that we can bring over here to the Philippines? And at the same time, are you seeing any practices here in the Philippines that you think are pretty good that should, uh, should travel abroad? Keenan. Thanks, Ajay. I think we've already heard some very innovative practices and very innovative ideas coming out of the Philippines, especially around telemedicine and video consultations. Um, some of the other noteworthy initiatives that I would like to highlight that we've seen both in this region and, and globally has been around extending care delivery outside of the hospital and how that can be done efficiently and very rapidly in this in the pandemic situation. And we've worked with a number of healthcare providers and non-healthcare partners in some situations to uh, convert transport vehicles like buses into a medibus, where they will have video consultation equipment, medical devices, connectivity to the hospital, and clinicians on the bus itself. So that bus can basically travel to all of the regions um, within a country or within an area and provide clinical services to the poor, as Dr. Tag was mentioning, or people that simply can't travel to the hospital because they can't leave homes. So that's been a, a very interesting initiative um, both with buses and in some cases with ambulances as well, working with the emergency services. Uh, within the hospitals, we're seeing an increased usage of robotics and robots, where we've worked with a number of hospitals to um, install video endpoints and connectivity onto robots. Mm -hmm. So that, that allows the hospitals and clinicians to do remote testing um, and treatment of the patients while keeping the patients and the clinicians safe and secure uh, within the hospital. And this has been a very interesting uh, initiative in a, new, in a few hospitals um, that has been driving it forward. Around the um, safety and security of the patients and clinicians, we're also seeing a lot of hospitals starting to use location services and wireless infrastructure mm -hmm. to be able to assign zones within the hospital for COVID-19 testing, for COVID-19 treatment, and the ability to track patients, clinicians, and assets within those zones so that they can identify who has been where at what point who they come into contact with. And this is also helping a lot with the contact tracing by providing information within the hospital so that we can take the necessary measures, as well as providing that information to the Ministry of Health and government entities. And doing also as well to help with cybersecurity of, of these, of, with the different hospitals uh, around the region. Yeah, cybersecurity obviously is a top of mind for a lot of people. Um, a lot of the hospitals have had to deploy a lot of telemedicine and teleconsultation services very rapidly. Um, and it's always a balance between the ease of use so that the mm -hmm. patients don't have to go through 10 different screens to have a consultation, but also keeping the enterprise-based security um, that comes with the solutions. So we are one of the leading security providers in the world and all of our security um, solutions are integrated into our technology platforms. And it is top of mind for us to make sure that um, every consultation and everything that the hospital is doing is secure, is reliable, um, and will not be um, um, will not be attacked by any of the um, ransomware or malware. That's right. And also, a lot of them right now are doing a lot of teleconferencing facilities. I know that uh, that you also have your own very very secure teleconferencing facility with a lot of uh, products and product features. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about the teleconferencing facilities that uh, that you're able to provide through Cisco. Yes, of course. Um, we, again, we are working with a lot of hospital providers to make sure that the teleconferencing and, tele and, and video um, solutions that we have can be deployed within hospitals. Again, part of that is ease of use, both for the clinicians and for the patients, so that, again, they can basically click on one button and engage in a tele teleconsultation with the patients or with the clinicians. We're also starting to implement new technologies around artificial intelligence and machine learning within the solution. So that as the consultation is happening, um, the teleconsultation system will take clinical notes and can trans transcribe the notes. Um, we are simplifying the integration into healthcare systems. So when a clinician is having a consultation with a patient, they can pull up an X-ray image and actually see the X-ray image together in the same screen with the patient 
do annotations on it, instead of having to have three, four different screens and different systems that are integrating. So it's all about how do we make it easy to use and how do we make, it, make sure it remains secure and reliable for everyone. Thanks so much, Kim, for enlightening us on what's happening uh, on your end. Now, here's the question I want to ask really all, all of our panelists here today. And, you know, as I wear my entrepreneurial mind, uh, my entrepreneurial mindset, people often say, right, you know, uh, this is a pain point. Basically, what's happening right, right now to us during this pandemic, it's a pain point. And you want to be able to address this pain point and turn it into an opportunity for you. And uh, as you turn, you know, as, we, as we put on that mindset that we have to, uh, we have to adjust and pivot our businesses to solve uh, this pandemic and how it's affecting our business, what do you think uh, will be trends or, or, or innovations or pivots that we have to make right now that will last not only for this pandemic, but might be a long-term sustainable solution for the healthcare industry? Uh, Kit, for you, what do you think the changes that we have to make right now that won't, uh, won't just last for this pandemic, but rather will last for an ongoing basis? Yeah, well, uh, we've, since we, we've seen the uh, demonstration of these technologies already, right? So, and in some cases, there's been uh, successful business models on how to make this work and how to sustain this. So, I don't think this is going away. In fact, uh, right now, if we're talking about telemedicine, and mm -hmm. that's, that topic has been... Uh, around for the past 10 years already in the healthcare IT industry, we should now start looking forward to what else uh, we can do moving forward, right? So, in, uh, so from telemedicine, we're already looking into ubiquitous medicine, uh, right? So how do you how do you provide uh, monitoring services? How do you provide consultation services uh, where and when the patient needs it? So it's we're not just limited to the confines of the hospital anymore. Uh, Hospital-wide um, IT implementation, uh, uh, to my mind, is a thing of the past. Right, right now it's more of a uh, business-wide. And when when I talk about business, it's not just within the uh, confines of the four walls of the hospital. We're seeing we're already developing different business models, business, uh, different uh, business strategies. Uh, to provide services uh, beyond hospital care, as what we call it. Okay, so as as we imagine it, uh, more and more technologies will be available uh, in the hands of the consumers, which the uh, the enterprises, the hospitals, can leverage on. Okay, we're now seeing Internet of Things implementations, not just within the hospital but in the households of the consumers themselves. How do you monitor patients with cancer, with diabetes, hypertension, stroke? How do you do tele, um, uh, tele rehabilitation, as what was mentioned earlier, uh, when and where the patient is? That's right, that's right. That's, that's really great news because as I think of it, it's like saying you can bring the hospital home with you with technology. So the monitoring of the hospital doesn't end when you leave the confines of the hospital. Which is, which is uh, I think, which is a great thing. Because for myself, my dad just had a bypass. And, you know, for me, it's very hard, right? Now, how do you monitor him in the home, at, at home? And uh, it'd be nice if you could monitor him all the time, even when he was home, using the new ubiquitous medicine as well that the uh, hospital uh, has to offer. Thanks so much uh, for that perspective, Kit. And uh, with that, I also want to ask uh, over there in Cebu, James, what do you think will be the long-lasting innovations that are going to result from this pandemic? I think out of this pandemic, remote hospital services will be the in thing. Uh, wearables will be there so that um, doctors and patients are always connected. I think that's the way uh, to the future. Uh, after that, um, I think all, uh, I also think that services uh, that are traditionally uh, within the hospital will further follow patients home. Meaning, uh, if say for example, blood works used to be done uh, at the hospital, instead I think uh, home visits by a lobotomist can be done at the, at, at the premise of, uh, of the patient. So that they're secure, especially those uh, immunocompromised 
will just stay at home and then they can order tests at home. So those are the things that I really think will prosper after this pandemic. Yeah, echoing the same sentiments that uh, that uh, Kit was uh, saying earlier on. So we see that that's, this is probably where the direction is going to be going here, not just in the Philippines, but maybe uh, the rest of the region. Uh, Dr. Eric, do you also have the same opinion? What do you think is going to be the long lasting uh, changes brought about uh, with regard to the innovation that's occurring during this pandemic? Okay. 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 I see a future where people take action on their health needs. They mm -hmm. don't have they don't have to be cajoled, they don't have to be pressured. People will act on their health needs by themselves because they will trust technologies that are inclusive trust technologies that will actually help them navigate the entire healthcare system. The continuity of care will not be a problem for them. I see that future, but for that future to happen, mm -hmm. there should be coordination, collaboration, cooperation, that we will work together, not only the private sector, the public sector, even the industry, we have to guarantee that we will work together because the future is, is just out there. And the future starts with what we are going to do now. And so when people act on their health, this is the situation we want to happen. You don't start your telemedicine when you just say, can you hear me? Rather, <laughs> you say, I hear you, we're going to take care of you, let's do this together. Thank you, RJ. Thanks. And, and Dr. Eric, just to add to that one, I mean, I, I like the point that you kept on bringing up that, you know, our healthcare must be inclusive, technology must be inclusive. What sort of innovations do you think we're learning right now uh, that can help with the inclusiveness of healthcare moving forward from this pandemic? Uh, well, right now, to tell you, frankly, we're working uh, closely in a partnership with Cisco. We have, uh, for example, established telemedicine platforms, which is uh, community based. And so, therefore, uh, people in communities in Quezon City don't have to have to own their own gadgets because mm -hmm. uh, we have provided them with platforms that allows them to actually enjoy their sessions for telemedicine. And mm -hmm. what's good about this is that there's also telementoring. Well, you can imagine, RJ, even before the health providers, those who volunteered with the Department of Health and local governments to provide these services, there's hair and makeup, there's voice lessons. These are all the gestures. These are changes that's happening. It's all out there because we want to make sure patient engagement and patient experience becomes A-OK, -okay, at least here in the Philippines. Thank you, RJ. Thanks so much, Dr. Eric. Uh, and then, Cindy, for you, what, what do you think will be the long-lasting changes? I mean, your aggregating of, uh, of, of health care providers, is, I think it's a, it's a fantastic solution for a country like us to help with the uh, inclusion in health care. Uh, what do you think are the other lasting changes that will happen as a result of this pandemic? So I actually see three key things. No? First, um, the intense use of uh, data, no? uh, which... Uh, as uh, Keenan mentioned, will help in machine learning, um, AI, mm -hmm. right? And also more importantly for predicting certain uh, certain activities, no? like for patient care, for certain health needs, especially uh, geography-based uh, care needs. No? I think that will be something that we will be focusing on in the few years to come. Secondly, I also really think that the HMO industry and the healthcare industry uh, in general <coughs> will actually start to create products that are not necessarily too massive in scale. You know, uh, if you look at HMOs, usually they're in the hundred thousands coverage. But I believe that there will be products down the line that are really in the moment of need kind of category. Yes. Uh, whether it's prepaid or installment or what have you, it's going to be specific for a specific need. And lastly, I think um, 
Dr. Tayag sort of mentioned this, no? the fragmented or the sharing economy approach to the healthcare industry. And I don't know if I was able to describe this earlier, but the way we do service delivery for all care is we're not quite brand conscious. It doesn't matter which provider it is as long as the service is provided. So we've actually had to, in some cases, resort to a sort of freelancers or gig workers that are trying to do work. So, for example, doctors that aren't able to report to the hospital are now taking extra hours for telemedicine, right? And so, in a way, that has opened up the healthcare industry in the in the sense that you can be a freelancer doctor, a freelancer nurse, a freelancer uh, med tech, and still be part of the industry that's trying to really deliver services to to everyone, including the poor. Understand. Thanks so much. Very wonderful innovations coming out. Again, those are the silver linings of this uh, pandemic, which has actually accelerated many of the trends that were existing in the healthcare industry, but uh, just bringing them more to the forefront. And now I'd like to circle back uh, to Keenan. Keenan, um, you were mentioning earlier on that there were many solutions you've seen uh, around the region. Uh, where robotics is coming to the fore, and as we did mention many times over here, telemedicine uh, and, and other solutions. Uh, and if you were to like, take a look, with Cisco being a global technology company, what do you think are the best innovations you're seeing and best practices around the world that you think our local healthcare providers can adopt, especially those that are contactless, I guess that's the key thing right now, doing out of contactless solutions uh, here in the Philippines. Uh, what are your thoughts on this one? Thanks, Sajay. Um, I'd like to echo what Kit and James were saying around um, well, where the impact is going to be. And what we're seeing a lot is uh, preventive care and primary care being impacted by the pandemic. And that is definitely going to change going forward. Um, along with that, is extending the healthcare to home, to people's home, using medical devices and mobile devices, and being able to take the information generated at someone's home and integrating that with the electronic medical record systems or health systems. Um, so that the clinicians can, in real time or near, near real time, remotely monitor the patients and the effectiveness of the care treatments that are being provided. And tying in to that is the patients having more data for themselves, which is empowering the patients themselves to be able to take actions based on the data that's being generated and not um, necessarily relying always on the, on the clinicians. Um, within the hospitals, we're also seeing an increased usage of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, there's a lot of data that's being generated through all the medical devices and information systems these days. And increasing of what we're seeing is the hospitals using AI and machine learning to streamline and optimize the processes within the hospitals to understand where some bottlenecks are and to be able to take action against that. Whereas mm -hmm. before we didn't have enough information um, to be able to uh, make these decisions. So we've got an increased view of informed decisions. And from a clinical support perspective, we're also seeing an increase of AI and ML. Um, I'm sure a lot of um, the, the healthcare providers in the Philippines are exploring this as well around um, telehealth and radiology with image processing to be able to have AI algorithms that can look at an X-ray image and essentially come up with a diagnosis similar to a radiologist. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Keenan. And having said that, I just want to bring the question back to our uh, our practitioners over in the hospital, uh, especially when you talk about things like machine learning and, and AI. And when I look at both Kit and, and James and uh, Dr. Eric, uh, I'm thinking that you know it, it's not that uh, will you do it. It's a matter of uh, it's a matter of asking you when will you do it. So, uh, Kit, how about you guys? What do you think of? I mean, the different solutions were there. You were talking about them earlier on, and. And Keen was just saying, I, I'm reinforcing that, that you're, you're on the right path. When do you think we'll start implementing things like mach, uh, machine learning and AI to help, uh, to help hospitals uh, in their processes? Yeah, well, well I agree that it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, right? So, for example, we've started uh, implementing our hospital information system and electronic medical records uh, way back uh, 2013, uh, uh, 2014. Uh, right now, we're moving towards the next generation platforms. Uh, we've been in the been using Cisco as our uh, core uh, wireless connectivity uh, partner uh, for uh, several years now, and uh, we, we're very happy with how agile their platform is mm -hmm. and how it evolved towards more than just being a uh, a network provider. It's become more intelligent. Uh, uh, in the past few years, uh, currently in Mahati Medical Center, we've 
uh, we've harnessed a lot of our data uh, in uh, uh, that that we gathered from taking care of COVID positive patients, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we've we've already learned the patterns and behaviors of these patients. Uh, we've used these analytics insights uh, in terms of policy changes. So for example, uh, we've uh, learned early on that uh, infection among healthcare workers happen not in the floors where they're protected by personal protective equipment. It usually happens when they're eating in the pantry, right? Oh, wow. Because they, they put down their masks, right? They're talking to each other. So, you know, uh, immediately after learning that, we've, we've taken all of the chairs and tables from the pantry. So nobody <laughs> eats in the pantry anymore, <laughs> right? But that, that's just one, one of the practical examples how we've leveraged on, uh, on data that we that we gather and uh right now we're also uh looking at shifts in terms of uh business models right so we're we're learning uh what business models may continue to work uh despite the pandemic and which business models uh may not continue to work with, uh, during the pandemic and even after the pandemic so we're rapidly evolving um, our hospital services to adopt to these changes. Thanks so much for enlightening us. And I'm very glad that there's some data which will be of good use to all of us. Uh, and hopefully, like you said, in the spirit of collaboration, it's everything that we should know from, from Manila to Cebu to the public hospitals. These are information that we can collaborate on, especially when the, when the, the rich data starts coming out. Uh, James, how about you guys in, in Chongo? I'm sure also that... Uh, it's only a matter of time until you start doing machine learning and AI to make the services more effective and efficient uh, in delivering services to the customers and to the healthcare providers. Yeah, RJ. Um, yeah, it's really a matter of when. Um, I have ideas on how to implement it, uh, but the more important thing to consider is the culture. Um, are my doctors ready to uh, embrace artificial intelligence, uh, therefore machine learning? Are my pharmacists ready to embrace it also? So it's a question of the culture and readiness. As to the, um, as to the platform or uh, the technology, yes, it's there. And uh, a lot of um, institutions are already using it. You know? um, but um, as to when we will be ready, I will find out in a couple of months. <laughs> well, that's great. It's a, a, I'm glad it's a couple of months instead of a couple of years. So that for me, that's good news for us, especially uh, in light of this pandemic and how much information we're actually gathering from this. Again, thanks so much, James. Uh, Dr. Tayag, I'd like you to chime in as well. I mean, you, you've been working with Cisco as well. So, I mean, you've got access to their technology. Do you think also our public hospitals will be doing a lot of AI and machine learning? Because there's a lot of data across all the public hospitals that can be used uh, to learn better how to treat our patients. RJ, surprise, we're doing it. AI, we're doing wow. it. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because we wanted the technology to be inclusive and because that's almost impossible. So we had a solution. Okay. We had to put technology out there that will actually be prioritized to our wider audience. So for the tech savvy, we have the AI. AI supported chatbots on social media. So you don't have to talk to an actual person. The AI actually helps you navigate the patient services that you need, the patient, the information patient needs. So we're doing it. And for our data analytics, our prediction models, uh, we're using AI. And so therefore, big things are here to come, but in the public sector, we always say that the private are not our competitors. They, we have to work with them. We have to work with industry. Now that the pandemic is showing us what will happen if we don't work together, okay? It's not the time to compete. It's the time to unite. Thank you, RJ. We're doing it.
Thanks so much, Dr. Eric. That's a really a bright spot that's happening here right now. Glad to see that our public hospitals are adapting very easily. And, and again, thanks so much for the great job that you're doing there with UH. And with that, we'd like to thank all of our guests who have joined us and given us a better perspective of what is happening to our healthcare industry. Again, maraming salamat again to all those joining us. We've had with us right now Makati Mez Chief Information Officer, Kit Sumabat. Thanks so much, Kit. Again, Chomo Hospitals IT President, uh, Vice President for IT, James Indino Jr. And of course, from the Department of Health, Dr. Enrique Tayag, and from C the CEO of All Care, Cindy Burdett. Thanks so much for joining us, along with Keenan Yoruko. Cisco's industry advisor for healthcare here in the ASEAN region. Should you wish to learn more about Cisco solutions that can be tailored to fit your own business, please visit this website. Again, my name is RJ Ledesma. Thank you so much for joining us for the second episode of our Cisco Executive Live Series, Navigating the Shift. We will see you for the next webinar. Have a great day. April 16th, 2018. This is Tokyo. This is Rakuten. These are Cisco executives invited to a meeting with Rakuten. This is Tarek Amin, CTO of Rakuten Mobile. This is Prakash Suthar, team leader from Cisco Customer Experience. Namaskar. Good morning. This is a story about doing something that's never been done before. Prakash, I need someone to help me build the world's first end-to-end -end cloud native network. We need a partner. Let's do it. In order for this to work, it has to be optimized for 5G. We'll design it from scratch. Fully automated. Fully virtualized. Cloud. Core. Transport. Virtual RAN. Everything. Everything. It will be the first of its kind. Oh, yeah. You can figure it out. We can figure it out. This is their idea. It's an ambitious idea. An unprecedented idea. It's true. But this is what industry executives called it. Impossible. 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 But that didn't stop them. That just made them hungry. So Prakash, how about developers? We'll create a platform. Different systems. Different partners working, working together. together. What else? This is the plane that took the Rakuten team to San Jose. Okay, so it takes three weeks to implement a traditional radio site. With automation, we can do it in 10 minutes. And more secure. Zero touch. Zero defect. Ready for 5G. Just upgrade the software. This is Tarek's impressed face. This went on for months. We're going to need new hardware. Then we'll partner with your vendor. But our design? You got it. Then Tarek said. And we want you to manage the whole chain, oversee the integration of vendors and partners. Good morning. February 3rd, 2019. This is Rakuten and Cisco and their impossible idea making their first call. Oh, my God. And the world just changed. Rakuten and Cisco customer experience. The right solutions, the right technology, most importantly, the right people. Between ideas and invention, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. My name's Ami Tank. I've been at Cisco for 20 years. Grace Girls Home is a girls' orphanage in Sri Lanka. We have over 40 girls right now. They come from really difficult backgrounds tremendous circumstances, yet they have resilience, you know, they've got passion, and they want to grow up to help others. We provide them with housing, care, food, nutrition, doctors, mental health care, dental visits, and all of that. I am the chief of staff, and I manage the board. There's so many ways that technology can be used to end poverty, to help these girls. One is through online education, but we need a way to track it, to manage it, to work with the girls, and to continually kind of improve on it. When you allow a girl to stand on her own two feet, either through education, opportunity, exposure, whatever, you can raise a community. My mom, who has just recently passed away, she lived and grew up in pure poverty. She always persevered. Before she passed away, she said, You've got to continue to give in life because that's the purpose of life. That to me is really what inspires me. One girl said to me, promise me when you leave here, you'll be my voice. And I told her, I said, when I leave here, I'm going to tell everybody about you. Between Sri Lanka's lost girls and a future full of opportunity, there's a me tank.
Growing up, I always wanted to be helpful. I was inspired by my mother and how she helped my community. My mom would cook a lot of Syrian food. One day, she asked my brother and me to deliver meals to our neighbors in need. She taught me that when you help others, anything is possible. Even leaving my country to pursue a degree. When I landed, I was shocked to see the level of poverty. I thought, how could such a wealthy country waste so much food when so many people are worried about their next meal? I heard my mother in my ear, and I knew what I needed to do. I started taking surplus food that would otherwise be thrown away and giving it to those who would benefit from it. I could see the tremendous impact right away. I recruited some smart students, and with Cisco's help, we were able to build an automated platform to connect food donors to communities with food insecurity. Not only are we putting good food to use, but also can track the positive impact on the environment. With sharing Cisco's purpose to power an inclusive future, we've been able to provide over two million meals across the U.S. My mother is my real hero. She taught me that a delivery so small could one day deliver on something so much bigger. Between a small gesture and a huge impact, there's a bridge. My name is Roy Vessel. I've been at Cisco for 12 years. Outside of Cisco, I work in teaching cybersecurity and cyber defense to youth through a program called Cyber Patriot and through the United States Air Force Civil Air Patrol. I took the team over and fell in love with it. We start at the age of 12, work all the way through high school. I want them to know how to take care of themselves and protect their information, protect themselves, protect their families. We've got kids that have graduated through my program that are now working for the government. Uh, I've got folks that are working in corporations looking for cyber threats and how do we prevent them. Cisco's been heavily involved. If you have something that you have on your heart um, or passion that you want to reach out and do, talk to your manager. The satisfaction of seeing uh, these kids grow, uh, seeing those light bulbs go off, that's my payment. Between curious kids and the future of cybersecurity, there's Roy Vestal. Greatness accepts no lag, no delay, no excuses. It lives in the tiny space between milliseconds and nanoseconds, between memes and legends, between tears and tears. And when margins that small make an impact this big, nothing less than the speed and dependability of the Cisco network will do. My name is uh, Lucy, uh, it's uh, my English name. A Chinese name is Xiu Fan. I come from Beijing, China. Uh, I have been uh, working in Cisco for 19 years. I'm a sales manager in customer experience team. I think Cisco is really a great company. Cisco support us giving back live days. We have some energy, we, we have the eager from the heart. So everybody, when they, when they know what I'm doing, they, they just uh, raised hand. Lucy, <laughs> give me a chance, I want to join. I can make something happen. I work for the Green and Shine Foundation uh, since six years ago. They had a lot of programs, but the major program is support rural uh, teachers and the rural children for the reading program. The children really need resources to support them and to get a learning capability to support their future. We actually leverage Cisco some technology like WebEx. Uh, we, we provide some training to the teacher. They can, you know, improve their skill and their reading knowledge and they can know the world better. I think the Together, uh, we have a big power. It's uh, not only one or two uh, children can benefit from that. I'm proud of that. 
Between rural school kids and a universe of learning, there's Lucy Guo. Between wisdom and curiosity, there's a bridge between ideas and inspiration, trauma, and treatment. Gained a couple of more pounds since last time. That's good for the Between the people and their leaders. It's been very busy. It was busier today than yesterday. When are you going to come back? Collaboration. In the center. And creativity. You don't want that sketch to compete with the image. Between the moments that make us who we are. Now we unite. And keeping them safe, private, That's great. and secure. There's WebEx. Beautiful. April 16th, 2018. This is Tokyo. This is Rakuten. These are Cisco executives invited to a meeting with Rakuten. This is Tarek Amin, CTO of Rakuten Mobile. This is Prakash Suthar, team leader from Cisco Customer Experience. Namaskar. Good morning. This is a story about doing something that's never been done before. Prakash, I need someone to help me build the world's first end-to-end -end cloud native network. We need a partner. Let's do it. In order for this to work, it has to be optimized for 5G. We'll design it from scratch. Fully automated. Fully virtualized. Cloud. Core. Transport. Virtual RAN. Everything. Everything. It will be the first of its kind. Oh, yeah. You can figure it out. We can figure it out. This is their idea. It's an ambitious idea. An unprecedented idea. It's true. But this is what industry executives called it. Impossible. 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 But that didn't stop them. That just made them hungry. So, Prakash, how about developers? We'll create a platform. Different systems. Different partners working, working together. together. What else? This is the plane that took the Rakuten team to San Jose. Okay, so it 